So now that we have a truly great collection of mathematical objects to play with, namely the set of natural numbers, then we sign them, then we look at the rational numbers, the ratio of integers, then we look at the real numbers that include the irrational numbers, those that we cannot write as ratios precisely, and uh, recently we looked also at the complex number and the set of vectors, Rn, of real valued vectors of dimension n, where n is 1 integer. So now that we've got this great relation, it's time to do things with these uh, objects. And we already did a lot of things, of course. We uh, did some algebra, which means that we multiplied them, we added them, we applied these rules of associativity, commutativity, distribution. So we did a lot of operations already. But it's time to bring this idea of manipulating this object to its fullest extent. And the fullest extent includes this concept of functions, which is the topic of today. So what is a function? A function is not something that is restricted to numbers or to vectors. It's something that applies more generally to sets. So I will take um, a generic set that I will call A and use this convention that we kind of double or make bold these letters. And it's a mapping between the set A and another set B. I take them uh, whatever. In most cases, of course, we are going to consider numbers, but uh, to so that you get the idea that it's really an abstract concept, a mathematical notion that applies to uh, lots of different things, we take A and B. We don't restrict ourselves. And the function, so this mapping between A and B, what does it mean to be a mapping? It means that for any A that is part of this set uh, big A, we associate, we put a little tail here to show the difference between the sets and the elements, this is cosmetic, we associate an element B that belongs to B that we write uh, in this form, F of A. F of A is equal to B. So I could put here my free uh, sign, my free line, to mean that it's a definition of what F of A e is. It is the value, the one value that for every A in A, in every little small A in big A, I associate to B. So here it would be good to take examples. And to take examples, we're not going to jump right away onto numbers, even though that's mainly how we are going to deal with functions uh, using uh, mapping between uh, sets of numbers. Uh, we are going to take something like, uh, I don't know, the set of mathematician functions that I could call M. Uh, I will only use this curly M here and not try to write it uh, like this. Or I could write it like this if I am. Yeah, let's do this. Like this, there is uh, at least an illusion of consistency. So that's the set of all mathematicians. So who do we know uh, as mathematicians? So we've seen uh, al Khwarizmi is certainly um, Khwarizmi is certainly uh, qualifies as a mathematician. I'm not sure we are writing his name correctly. So let's put uh, Tartaglia, for instance, and uh, his enemy as well. So Del, Del, uh, Del Ferro, and there was Fior, if you remember our history of the uh, cubic equation. And this came to us uh, through the uh, Ars Magna of Cardano, That's Cardano in French, and his student of Cardano was Ferrari and uh, all the possible mathematicians, so a lot of them, yeah, I mean, we've seen Erdos, for instance, certainly Erdos should be there, you might have heard about this Erdos number, an interesting bit of, uh, of societal uh, science. So I don't put the melody, it's there in the ellipsis, we could put also people that are very famous, that you've heard about, like Euler, is the person who was in front at the opening of this video, or Gauss, another very important mathematician, well, all of them. So I'm not going to exhaust the set, even though it's a finite set, in principle, we could put all the mathematicians there. You might find the list maybe in the Wikipedia or somewhere else. But uh, in principle, we understand that it could be exhausted, this set of mathematicians. And what does it mean uh, to uh, define a function on this set? Well, what are the interesting functions? It could be, for instance, um, the, the function which is the uh, year of birth. I will call this Yob, the Yob function, year of birth. So it's a function from the set of mathematicians. The set of mathematician is actually a subset of the set of human, in which uh, you are yourself part of this set. I am mas myself in there too. Uh, assuming this considers that uh, every mathematician is human, that we don't put in there some machine, some computer, now, the definition might have to change. But anyway, the year of birth function applies to possibly other set, but it applies in particular to the set of mathematicians. So it takes um, the possible values, the possible variable in the set M. This is called the domain, by the way. The domain here, the domain is, is uh, the set in which the function is defined. And the set uh, in which she's taking the possible value, this function, we call that the codomain, a bit of terminology there. 
So the domain is definitely M. As far as year of birth is concerned, well, this would be an integer because we label years uh, after uh, numbers, like we are in year 2020 as I'm speaking now. And if we look, for instance, at the yob of, so it's not uh, accepted conventional terminology, yob. It's something I just made up right now. So uh, who do I know uh, which year they were born there? I know Euler. Euler was born in uh, 1707. I'm not making a mistake. And we could define another uh, function, defined as well from m to n, which is, of course, the yod, which, as you can guess, that happens to all of us, even to the best of us, the year of death. For Euler, this is 83. So from the yob and the yod, you could define other functions. And now we do uh, something which is interesting, which is like algebra of functions. We can see, for instance, that the, the age, or the, the age at it, h at def that we could define at add the add function the h at def i will do it there h at def the add of uh, euler is the uh, year of def minus the year of birth and then that becomes standard old-fashioned good uh, familiar algebra because this is things operation of this type and that gives us if we uh, subtract the two numbers that gives us the age of Euler the add of Euler when he died which is 76 so here you see that we are doing indeed some algebra function because we define the add as the yod minus the yob you didn't suspect this morning when you are uh, coming to uh, see these um, lectures that you would consider such kind of operations the add equal to the yod minus yob and again these are not uh, standard notations i'm using them uh, now for the first time and i'm certainly never going to use them again it's just to show you that when we define functions that are whatever we find a way to associate uh, 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 values to uh, elements of some given set then we can start to manipulate this function in a mathematical way, doing an algebra, so we could look if it makes sense that the uh, square of the add or this type of things. And we can apply this to all the elements of the function. So we can look at the yob and the yod of Gauss. Uh, it's interesting because the add of uh, Gauss is very close, actually, to the add of uh, Euler. Because uh, Gauss, I believe, he lived one year more than Euler, but not exactly at the same time. They have been contemporary, but n not enough so that they could interact. When um, Euler died, Gauss was still a little uh, child. The uh, job of Gauss is uh, 1777. So from that, I let you work out as an exercise if you want. The job of Gauss. Uh, you can give this problem to your friends, but you will have to provide all this background. Otherwise, they will not be able to make any sense of it. So that's an example of um, a generic function. And as I told you, this is to um, emphasize that the function is not restricted to numbers. But most of the time, we are going to use numbers that are defined on the set of numbers. So I'll give you, for instance, a function that is defined from the set of real number to the set of positive real number. This is the function, which uh, we would write like this, the absolute value. We can call it all the apps. Usually, we don't give name. Sometimes we do. We'll see that our most important function of today will come with a name of this uh, type, with three letters. But either we give symbols for the very important functions, like the absolute value, which to x, what it associates is the so-called absolute value of x, which is x if x is positive, and it's minus x if x is negative. So what it does, technically, you can put equal sign there, 0 is both positive and negative. What it does is to chomp the sign of, either is a minus sign, you just remove it, yeah? The absolute value of minus 7 is 7. Good, just remove the sign. So we don't write apps, we put just between these two things, just because it's so important. And over uh, important function, like the square root, we use this symbol, yeah? So we will see that the various functions come with possibly various names. Very good. Um, coming back to the most general type of functions, there's two properties that a function might have, which we need to know because they are important. These two properties are the property of being uh, injection, injective. A function can be injective and it can be surjective. And it can be both. If it's both, we are going to see what it is. If it's both, if it's both injective and surjective, we say that it is bijective, bijection. So what defines uh, the injection? The injection is if two different values of the uh, domain 
for these two different values, the function provides two different values in the codomain, right? Or said otherwise, it means that uh, every value of the domain gives a different value in the codomain. So in mathematical terms, a function is injective if and only if for uh, x different of y implies that f of x is different than f of y. It's certainly, certainly not the case of the uh, of the yod function because many people, many mathematicians are born on the same year. Um, another definition of this uh, injection by using the negation of the implication. Remember that if p implies q, then neg q implies neg p, or neg not for neg, as you want to call it. So not f of x different of f of y implies not x different of y. That's just the automatic negation of the implication. And now we look at what it is. Not to be different, it means to be equal. So we've got this alternative equivalent definition of the injection, which is that if f of x is equal to f of y, then this implies that x equal y, which is the same idea. Yeah? Look otherwise, if you are in the codomain B, and you've got, um, you've got the function that arrives there through two different ways, it arrives to the same value B in big B, it means that if the function is injective, it means that in the domain, these two things also originate from the same element. Yeah, A. We've got f of A equal B. So let me give you an example of an injective function. I should have thought about it uh, before. Um, the, um, the cube, for instance, the cube functions from R to R, the function that to x associate the cube of the value, there is no way that you take two different cubes and it will um, it will get the same cubed value for different variables. Okay, I'll let you check. Uh, instead, we are going to pass to the over, so we did the injections here. We are going to look at the over property, which is the surjection. So surjection, it means that the function extends the codomain. It extinguishes the codomain. It takes all the possible values that are possible in the codomain. So let's look at it again. We've got the function f. So sometimes we put the thing on top of the arrow yeah, to say that that's the mapping of the function between a and b. So what does it mean to uh, be surjective? It means that there is no value in b which the function doesn't take. We can always find, for any b that I find, I can always find um, an element of a that will be evaluated by the function that will return this value. So let's write this in symbolic term. For all for all b in b, there exists a in a, such that f of a equal b. That's the definition of surjection. And again, uh, if a function is both surjective and, um, and injective, then we say it is bijective. And it means that there is a one-to-one -one mapping. Every value in a is associated to a value of b, and vice versa, every value of b is associated to one value of a. So there is really a one-to-one -one mapping, very important type of mapping. That's the properties that the function can get in the most general setting. So we will leave it at that for now, but we will come back to these very notions in our next lecture when we describe, when we discuss infinity. For now, uh, I'd like to discuss the functions that are possible to define in all possible sets. And there are very few of them, actually. I can myself think of only one. There are certainly more, but I can think of one function, which is a constant function, or um, as many constant functions that there are elements in B. So constant function, we can call it C, or C C S T E, is a function which, for all uh, possible variable in the domain, the constant function of A is equal to B. So there, maybe I should be a bit more careful and say that there exists a b in b such that the constant function of a is equal to b. So it's not pretty to write it like this. I will write this function c simply. Okay. So it means for all the value of the domain, the function is evaluated to the same value. That's the constant function. And that's pretty much the only function we can define um, for all possible sets. Yeah, we can define it for the set of mathematician, for instance. If the set of mathematician is um, is defined from uh, well, so the set of mathematician to the set of integers, then there is one function, for instance, that we can think about, a constant function, which is the zero. So the zero, zero as a function, 
So far, it's, I write it here a number, but it can also be a function between two sets. It's defined, but provided so that it's defined, we need that zero, the number this time, is part of B. If zero, the number is part of B, then the zero function is defined as, so maybe better than zero, is, we could call it Z, because it's uh, more clear that it's a function and not just the number. Z of A is equal to zero. But this requires, again, that zero is part of B, and not all set B have to include the zero, for instance. That's otherwise a very important function, the zero function, for instance. Um, we have the identity function. This is really also a very important function. The identity, uh, we like to call it one, or like this, or i, the various names, or id. Let's call it id. So I will put it there. This is a respectable notation that we find often. I will call it one like this. So that's the function that for all a in a, we've got the identity of a is equal to itself. It's like the function. You give it the argument and you return the same things. That's an important function. But for this to be defined as well, it's not defined in all the possible sets, we need that A is a subset of B, right? So for instance, there is no identity function on the set of mathematicians to the set of integers, yeah? Because the Euler is not equal to a number. Okay, so those are important functions that we will find uh, in different contexts. Now, uh, now that we have seen functions mapping between two sets, let's look at uh, the next very important or obvious way to describe functions, to deal with functions. This is the so-called graph of the function. And the graph of the function is the set of couples a, f of a, when we have got the function defined between two sets. Yeah, so between like this. So that's this set of collections. And the name is not chosen uh, randomly, that's the reason why we choose this name, because of course we can link it to, if we take a particular case, so we've seen already our absolute function, which is defined from R to R+. plus. So this one is, by the way, is surjective if I define it in R+, plus. it's not surjective if I define it in R, because I'm missing all the negative value. Negative value don't have a result by the application of the absolute function by definition. And it's not injective neither, because I can take two different numbers, like minus one and one. These two different numbers, they give the same value in the in the domain in the codomain set, which is one, and we started with different number. So this one is surjective in R plus and it's nothing if it's in R. In any case, it's never uh, injective. It would be injective from R plus to R plus, for instance. Yes, in which case just the identity. So let's plot the graph of this. So given that this is um, a set of numbers, the usual way to plot a graph is to take an axis like this for this uh, set and for all the possible values that this function takes so that would be let's say 2 here we've got minus 2 yeah it's a bit more minus 2.5 we uh, we plot we attach on this set which is r plus so if it's r plus i should i cannot do it like this but i can do it like this i think i should make this uh, not part of my graph, I cannot go there by definition, I am only in R+, plus, which is the positive R. And then, so to 2, I associate the same value, 2. To 3, I associate 3. So the values themselves, I will put them in red. The part of the graph, here we are, that's our graph. That's this couple that I can represent on my graph here. So I've got it there, got it there. And if I do it for all of them, then I will get a continuous, continuum of possibilities. And that's the graph of my function, right? Yeah, as well, for minus 2.5, I went to 2.5, so on and so forth. So it's a very simple thing. This is nothing more than the plot of the function. And I took very simple one, absolute value. If I would take the square, yeah, I will put you here, uh, if you want, the value from R is still defined to R plus, which is R squared, it is something like this, assuming that this is 1 here, we got something like that for the square function. And how do we get this? Well, I take all the possible value there, I compute by making the square, if I take 2, I compute this is 4, if I take 3, this is 9, and then I put in this 2D plane the values, this couple, A, F of A, and like this I put the plot. So actually we could start even to look at um, at interesting families of functions, because now when we are dealing with functions, that's what we are going to do, is to look at families of functions and start to acquire a collection of functions with which we are going to, to work with. So one very important type of function is the power function, which to x associate, uh, we will call them uh, pn, we can call them, we associate xn. So again, we don't actually use this, that pn of x is x time x time xn time xn, we go directly for this. There is no name for the function. Yeah, we don't actually introduce this, um, this notation because there is really no need for it. 
Therefore, uh, I don't know what to put there. I will have to repeat the same thing, yeah? which makes the uh, correspondence, maybe the mapping a bit daft. But they poor function. Let's look at them. So n is integer there, to make it simple. Uh, of course, we could we have in an algebraic lecture define it for uh, for rational and even for real values. At some point, we will define it for complex value um, quantities. But uh, if we do this, so we've got my variable x. I've got here the values that it will take. I'm plotting uh, x zero, which is one. I will do in different color. So x zero is one. Then I've got x one. This is x. X2, we already plot before. I'm not taking the same color. That's by definition, that's x squared. We don't need to write again. It intersects at 1. It is symmetric and it's like this. So if you are not completely familiar with this, you should, of course, uh, take the time to plot, to build this function yourself and play with them. So it start to be a bit more interesting when you look at the next one, which is x cubed, because x cubed for the value of x, which are uh, below 1, that's 1 here. They all intersect, all the power functions take the value 1 at 1, as you can check. 1 multiplied by itself any number of times gives you 1. So x cubed is smaller, a cube is smaller than a square. And above it's larger. So the pink is below the blue below 1, and it's above the uh, blue above 1. And it is anti-symmetric this time, so it's like this. And it's, it's now it's equal to minus 1. And then we've got the same for x4, x5. Already I pretty much cluttered my curve there, so I will instead show you the, the result like this. You see that you've got the various power functions. So there are a very important family of functions, out of which we can build another important, respectable and uh, family of functions that we see all the time, which is the functions of polynomial, which is to do algebra with this power function. So mainly what we are doing is that we rescale them, so we multiply it by let's say uh, x cube, we rescale it by the uh, by the constant um, alpha three, and we add two over powers. So we uh, we can add to the rescaled fourth power like this, and do the same on the other side. So that gives us, on the most general case, something like this: is alpha k x k. It's the linear combination, the sum of the rescaled power. So that's what the polynomial is. It starts from zero, in which case it gives us the constant, and it goes up to n. This is called the order of the polynomial. Yeah, you can get the polynomial of order 2, that's the, uh, the quadratic function that we have already seen. So by the way, yeah, it's interesting to uh, look at uh, the quadratic equations. The quadratic equation, I remind you, is ax squared plus bx plus c. So that's a polynomial. I could put the n here to mean the degree of the polynomial. That's a polynomial of order 2. So solving the quadratic equation is to find when this polynomial is equal to 0. So that's our 0 here. Yeah because we are looking on the y-axis. So we've got 0, 1, 2, and the negative number, minus 1, so on and so forth. So R0 is this horizontal line. So what does it mean to find these uh, values of x for which the polynomial cancel? Take a different color. Is to see the quadratic equation is something like this, for instance. These are the two solutions. So we did find the solution minus b over 2a plus or minus square root of b square minus 4ac by completion of the square, and this you need to know how to do from the pure algeometric way, but there is also a very simple algebraic method. You draw your plot and you find its intersection with the, um, with the uh, horizontal axis. Yeah, that's a constant here. Yeah, that is C. In this case, C was negative. And you can see as well the various types of uh, solution that um, a polynomial can take, because yeah, I've got it, fantastic. So if I take a different polynomial, if I take this one, for instance, you see that the solution uh, change as well. So now we've got, that's less easy. Let me try to remove these points because they could uh, distract us. Okay, so the solutions are the intersection, all right? So I still have two solutions. Now I've got one solution which is zero and another which is there. I could label my axe as well, my horizontal axis, so that we can speak in more uh, clear term, so that's 3, 4, minus 1, minus 2. So if we look what we have here, we've got something like x minus 0 times x minus 2. But let's carry uh, let's carry on looking at the possible type of solution I get. So I've got two solutions there. Here I got one solution, which is degenerate. So it's x minus 1 squared. And of course, there is also this... Um, the, the, this coefficient 
the number that multiply my uh, square will uh, will change this. Uh, um, I don't know how to say in English. It will change this um, this width, yeah, the waist of a quadratic. So it could be like this or like this. All this aquatic, and the sign would change in this way. Yeah, the sign would make it like this. If it's minus something, I will go negative. So it's all this type of of uh, quadratic curve that are the so-called parabola. Yeah, functions that are like this. But I can display them. I can squeeze them or open them, and I can reverse the sign. So here we've got two solutions, and here we have no solutions because you see that it doesn't intersect. We've got this this gap there. Yeah, there's all this distance that keeps us away from the intersection. So this one, the quadratic equation, if you try to apply this formula uh, for the discriminant, you will find that it gives, it yields complex solution. They are not in the real plane, they are in the complex plane. But that's the fundamental theorem of algebra. Any uh, polynomial equation of order n, of degree n, has exactly n solutions. So we still have two solutions for this quadratic equation, but they are, um, they are not real. That's for the quadratic. If you would look at the cubic, because we also look at the cubic, the cubic looks like this on the other hand. It's a function which is like this. Okay. It's, unlike the uh, quadratic equation, which has the same behavior for the big uh, positive x and the uh, big negative x, so it's either both going up or both going down, depending on the sign of a. For the cubic equation, the big uh, positive cube is opposite to the big negative cube. Yeah, I don't know if you see what I'm trying to do. What I'm going to tell you is that that's a cubic equation. If I take another type of cubic with a different sign, I will get something like this, for instance. That's another cubic equation. So this one is going down and this one is going up. Which means something that you can try to convince yourself. We can have uh, several solutions. We can have, so according to the uh, fundamental theorem of algebra, we always have exactly three solutions. And indeed, you can see that, for instance, if I do something like this, I bring this up, now we've got so I, I will take one which has more curvature because otherwise they will be really jammed together. In fact, they, they could be the generator as well, yeah, which is almost the case that we have there. So that's the quadratic equation. Let me put it in a different color, color I never used before, like this very beautiful uh, bluish color. Okay, so we've got one, two, three, and depending on where we are, we can have less than three solutions. Yeah, but we will always have at least one solution. So you see that this gra graphical method to plot is very powerful because we uh, actually now we are postulating, we didn't demonstrate, you can try to demonstrate it, but we can state with a lot of confidence that a cubic equation always has at least one, one real root, whereas the quadratic equation can have none. So I'm pretty sure if you give it five seconds thought, you can make a similar statement for the quartic equation, the one that have been solved by the Ferrari. Okay, so uh, so far we looked at these um, algebraic uh, functions that we defined through the tools that we already covered in previous lectures. We could look as well as the um, as the uh, power functions, the power functions with the rational um, power. So in particular, we could look at uh, a one half, which is a quantity that if multiplied by itself will give me a. So by definition, this is the square root of a. Why am I using a now rather than the uh, variable x that we've been using all this time? I'm not too sure, but okay. So we could look at this, and indeed we can graph it. And uh, this I will leave for a bit later, because we'll come back to this uh, to this function, to the uh, to the fractional power functions. But just to be exhaustive, I will show you what it looks like. The square root. That's the square root of x. If we've got x, so the square root of x. That's an example of a function which is defined on r plus. At least if we want the value in r. Or in r plus if we define the square root on r completely which means that we want it to have a value there to provide a value there then we have to define it in c because you know that square root of minus one is equal to i and i doesn't belong to r it belongs to c okay so uh, the square root in this most common popular uh, use is defined on R plus, and it looks like this, yeah? And you are computing the same, so you are doing the reverse process. That's precisely how we will look at this uh, integer power function, is when we look at the problem of inverse functions, which means that if I've got uh, nine, what is the square root of nine is the number which multiplied by himself give us nine, so this is three. If I've got four, the square root of four is two, so on and so forth, the square root of one is one, and that's how you build the square root. But let's not look at this, um, too much more. Instead, let's look at the other important algebraic operation that we considered before, which is the exponential 
yeah, which is to take for a constant a, so a is uh, is in q or in r, yeah, we take the function that to x associates a x. And this we can plot as well, so I will show you the exponential, what they look like, that's x, that's my 0 for x, that's my 0 for y as well, and that's y here. So the exponential is something like this, for given a, for instance for a equal 2. So the same thing, you compute um, a 2 to the uh, 1, so 2 to the 0 is 1, 2 to the 1 is 2, so it's not quite to scale, but you get the idea. Um, 3 to the, sorry, 2 to the 3 is 8, it's 8. So this is not to scale this y-axis, but that's the good shape. Do it carefully, uh, take the time to plot the functions. I'll actually show you in a, in a little while what it is, and you'll get the um, you'll get the exact shape. So we can take over value, so if I take a equal 3, let us say the next integer to make it simple, so we compute the same. We've got 3 to the power of 0 is 1, so all the, po all the exponential function will pass by this point. That's a common point for everybody. Then we've got 3 to the 1 is 3, so that's a bit uh, higher, so it will go by there. 3 to the 3, that's um, 9 times 3 to the 3. Yes, so that's 9 times 3, that's 27, so that's much higher. And this function, if I plot it, it will be like this, it will grow much faster, much stronger. So we say it passed by there. And then when it goes below, you can also check that it's actually going below. So that's the type of the exponential function. And we could look for value intermediate between 2 and 3. So actually now I'm not going to try to draw it because you see that my plot is looking miserable already, but let's have a look here at the actual uh, computer generated drawing. And I also put you in a uh, zoom uh, in the caption so that you see what happens in this negative x, where the functions are much more closer to each other. So we can say a lot of things about the exponential functions, in particular that they grow very fast. You see that is really counterintuitive. Myself, I was doing something which is really smooth. The exponential goes very fast. You hear a lot about this exponential feature in the news, in the medias, to mean something out of control that uh, grows very fast. And it indeed grows very fast, at least if A is itself is quite big. Uh, if you look on the other side, you see that uh, its, um, it's um, evolution is much more tame. So that's kind of function that we can define using the algebra algebraic tools, the algebraic concept that we have already defined previously. Very good. Now I'd like to um, carry on a little bit and bring you to discuss with me over mechanism to define functions because it doesn't all rely, a lot of it, but it doesn't entirely rely on using algebraic combination of numbers. Instead, we can provide a mechanism or a definition that is a way for uh, when you uh, feed a number to your function it uh, applies this mechanism and it spits the results. So, um, for instance, there is this very important type of function, the trigonometric function. Trigonometric, it means functions that are defined on the circle, especially on the trigonometric circle. Trigonometri trigonometric circle is a circle of radius 1, and for which we define the angle, for the uh, angle theta, in such a way that it's increasing like this. So this is 0, we've got 90 degrees, We've got 190 degrees, so on and so forth. And we come back and 360 degrees. It's 270 degrees, so on and so forth. Um, that's the trigonometric circle. And there we define functions. Uh, actually, it's better maybe if I show you on the computer. I'll tell you the two most important ones, and then we look at them on the computer. Just to see, maybe make a little experiment to see if the computer assisted or generated graph is more clear than what I draw myself with pen and paper or with a tablet and, and weird pain. So we define two important functions from the set of angles. So the set of angles, the set of angle is defined between uh, 0 and 360 degree. Or if we use uh, radiant is 0 and 2 pi. So I will use the degrees because we didn't introduce radiant yet. You might know them certainly, but just in case you didn't see them so that you are not scared, we'll define from the set of angles. So the set of angles is the set of all the possible number x that are between 0 and 360 degrees, in which case we made one complete turn on the circle. And from this set of, um, of uh, angle, we define two functions, the sine and the cosine, that take value between minus 1 and 1. The, the real numbers between minus 1 and 1. And they are defined like this, the sine, we start with the sine, the sign is such that 
this is the projection on the y-axis. So for my angle theta here, the sine of theta, this is this distance here, the sine of theta. So this is indeed between minus 1 and 1 because it is at most 1. So again, my graph is not perfect. Huh? We'll see with the computer if we can improve the situation. Because the maximum value is, is, is here. Well, on my graph, it's there actually. Yeah, because I just have, don't have the perfect drawing. But the art of geometry, as you know, is to reason correctly with wrong figures. That's what we are doing. So the maximum value is there. Oops, sorry, I don't want to remove that. Minimum value is when we look this angle, which is 270 degrees. Then the projection is this axis. If I take a slightly bigger angle, then I start to deviate and I got a slightly smaller number. So the sign is anything which is defined there between minus one and one. It could be zero. Is zero if I've got zero angle or 180 degrees angle. So you see that with this definition, the sign is the projection of the angle on the vertical axis. Then we define the function. Sine of theta is defined like this. We just have two measures and then we can make a, a list of values. So uh, for theta, we can take zero, uh, 90 degree, Let's take more angle, 45 degree, 90 degree, uh, 135 degree, so on and so forth. And we look at the sine of theta. So we can apply sine of theta. If I am there, I'm projecting on the zero. So the sine of zero is zero, which is something I will ask you to remember, especially because it remains true in radians. The sine of 45, you will have to measure what it is. Yeah, so I uh, not can tell you the answer now if you want that's this value square root of 3 by 2 this we will see where it comes from and why it is so but uh, without knowing it you can take your ruler and measure this this is a number which is less than 1 so I would put the value there the sine of 90 we said this one and then we go uh, here this sign will actually be the same by symmetry so that's again square root of 3 over two. then at 180 we are at 0 again and then we go negative so if I take this sign here which is 180 plus 45. That's um, 225 degrees. For 225 degrees, we are at minus square root over 3 divided by 2, again by symmetry. So that's the sign. That's an important function. The other important function I will put in read, which is the cosine. And the cosine is defined, as you might guess already, if you're a bit perspicace, is the projection on the x-axis this time. Okay, that's the thing. So let me now show you this on the computer because we have the chance, you are a lucky generation, you can use the computer, which has a lot of tools to do this correctly. So I'm switching on my computer. I'm logging in. I'm uh, putting the curve. Okay, so now you have it. And I'm using this so-called GeoGebra, which is one application you can find on the, on the internet easily. So the nice thing is that it allows you to define, we started with the sign. So let me zoom a little bit. That's a trigonometric circle. They also use this degrees notation, so we've got this particle angle. So it's interactive. You see, I can change the angle, and then you see that I go from 0 to 90 degrees, so on and so forth. 135, I didn't make a mistake. 225, fantastic, so I know how to add numbers. And then you see on this red thing that moves as I move my angle, this is the sign. That's the projection. I've got this point there, I project it here. So that's the value of the sign, okay? So indeed, the sign of 90 degrees is 1. Is stationary here, which means that if I change a little bit the angle around this thing, the sign doesn't change too much. We are going to come back to these features of the of the function, and then it changes a lot there. Here it's an extremum as well because if I pass this point, a little variation have big consequences. We go from, in fact, a positive number to a negative number, and then it's periodic because when we come back and we carry on, so here the uh, the angle we set, but actually we could keep counting. We could say that this is one times 360, two times 360. So 720 and carry on. Yeah. So that's a periodic function. And if I do this, you see we've got this very beautiful oscillation. Look at it. Don't look at me. Look at the oscillation. Up, down, up, down, up, down. This is the sine oscillation. Now let me put you the cosine. Cosine, as we said, is the orange run. I took the green. It's the projection on the x-axis. And you see that they are doing kind of complementary thing. They are doing the same thing, but on different axes. So there is a big uh, Correlation, a big, not correlation, a big um, interrelation between the sine and cosine. This is very beautiful like this. We will see that actually this type of oscillation, sine and cosine, they are part of several uh, physical phenomena. For instance, this could describe the oscillation of, uh, of um, a plane uh, wave of light. Yeah? Maybe we are describing light. So very beautiful as well. It's mesmerizing. And I hope it defines well the thing. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that we have got a purely geometrical uh, definition 
for a function, the sine and cosine. There is no algebra here. The beauty of it is that we can also define the sine and cosine through algebraic method. We'll come back to this later. We can connect algebra and geometry. Big breakthrough of mathematics. So far, I want to introduce other functions, like this tan, for instance, you don't see it because there was this poor choice of color, but in yellow, you got a tangent function. And how is the tangent function defined? Well, you have to take the tangent precisely there. So I will not take the yellow like them, but uh, something. I take the tangent. And the tangent is this distance when we extend this line, it's how, how it intersects. So unfortunately, they didn't do, um, do it themselves, but I think we can do it if I take a line like this. Yeah, I can click here and here okay and now if I come back we have defined our tangent and we can see tangent so we understand a tangent we look at the intersection of our radius that carries on where it intersects with the tangent so let's zoom out and we see this very beautiful property of the tangent is that it can become infinite because when the um, when the angle is small let's zoom to assure ourselves that this is the case I will put myself there when the angle is small, we've got a tame tangent in the sense that it's uh, well behaved. Actually, if you compare the yellow and the red, you see that we've got this approximation that we'll be using many times. The sine of theta is very close, in, with approximation, is close to the tangent of theta when theta is small. Yeah, when it means it's close to zero, positive or negative. Compare again the yellow and the red, you see they have the same size. That's when theta is small, because when theta starts to get uh, large, Let's take, for instance, this 45 degrees. You see, now already we can see that the yellow is much taller than the red. And it becomes dramatic because there, for instance, it's larger than one. Something that the sign can never do in the real variable. The sign can never get larger than one. And it's even much more dramatic because it can, of course, as you understand, it can become infinite. So let's increase our angle. You see that it grows without bound. So the computer is great, but uh, there's only so much it can do. I hope I'm not going to crash it. Uh, well, I cannot increase my angle. It cannot plot the infinity. I can only try. So you see that my tangent, my yellow line, becomes very big. Here we've got a tangent of 23. As an exercise for you, try to find which angle we have now. That gives this tangent of 23. So that's the tangent. I can show you another function, which is the cotangent. Cotangent is the same intersection, but this time we need to zoom again on the other axis. Okay, like this. So you see the tangent cotangent. So cotangent. You also see that it can become infinite, but this time when the um, when the angles are small, okay. You see that this big uh, discontinuous feature where we jump from positive to negative. Very good. Okay, so that's two definitions, and with these definitions of the algebraic features, we can do very uh, interesting introspection, or you can characterize the thing. For instance, you can see from the application of Pythagoras theorem, because as these are projections, this is a, a right angle triangle, we can see that the sine square, being this quantity, plus the cosine square, being this quantity, is equal to the square of the hypotenuse, which is the radius of the circle, which is 1. We are on the trigonometric circle. Therefore, we've got this important property, which I think you know, for all theta, we've got the sum of the square of the sine and cosine is equal to 1 very important. It's nothing more than Pythagoras on the trigonometric circle. Another uh, thing, the tangent, which is this quantity here, I remind you, if you remember Thales, the Thales uh, relationship, Thales I didn't put in the set of mathematicians, but it's one of the most famous names because it has this very important uh, observation that in two triangles that are so-called similar, which means you can fit one into the other, this ratio here divided by this ratio is equal is the same than this ratio even take the same color almost than this ratio here divided by this ratio okay so if we do this we've got that the tangent that's the definition divided by the radius which is one so that's the tangent is equal to this which is the sine divided by this which is the cosine so we relate we have another uh, important relationship which is that the tangent of theta is the sine of theta divided by the cosine of theta this actually, most people tend to take it as a definition of the tangent, but it's not the definition. Yeah? It's the consequence of Thales in the trigonometric circle. The same way you can see right away that the cotangent of theta is equal to the inverse by the definition. I let you check that in the trigonometric circle. Okay, so I can uh, stop my computer there. I will switch it off. I think it's uh, fine. 
and we can carry on with our lectures because we define already a lot of uh, of functions one was one way was through algebraic uh, definitions making powers taking exponential and this kind of things the other was providing a geometrical mechanism now i want to bring your attention to so that's the last thing last thing we are going to look at today i will uh, give you three types three families fn gn and hn defined in this way so i put the three equal sign to mean that's definition my first family i will define it like this i will take the sum from k equals zero to n so i'm putting a n here to mean that uh, my function has a so-called a, a parameter it has a variable the variable is there that's the x and for the f the x will be to take the exponentiation so it will be something like that but otherwise i've got a definition which will be that i will put one over k factorial so it's a series of functions i've got f1 f2 f3 so let's look at f2 of x for instance this is by definition one over zero factorial remember the factorial is the uh, product of consecutive integers so that's one over zero factorial which is one plus one over one factorial which is also one plus one over two factorial which is two so in this case the factorial i was about to say don't do much but yes because it uh, safeguards us against this division by zero because it's uh, 2.5 okay so f2 is 2.5 um, x f3 we would have to add the uh, next term so this is this this is the same thing but uh, we have don't forget the x we've got the next term which is 1 over 3 factorial which is 6 so it's 2 point 1 over 6 is 1.16 1.16 i can uh, approximate or add as 0.2 so that will 2.7 x yeah which is one of the curve you had from my previous uh, slide if you count that's uh, 1 2 3 4 that's this one yeah so we've got this function f3 if we don't approximate if we want instead of the approximation we want the equal that would be of course 2.66 um, uh, uh, yes unless i make a mistake computer will tell you which if i wanted to plot it in my graph i would have to put a phenom mesh yeah, to keep plotting more but i can go to arbitrary uh, precision i want so that's my f now let's go to the g the g i will define like this something a bit related a sum but this one this this case in this case i will put the variable x as part of the game so i will put the x there okay so it's different function of course it's not the same to have uh, x as a power function linear combination of power function so this is basically a polynomial here polynomial this is an exponential function and here that would mean my last definition this one is actually much simpler because it has no sum the parameter n intervenes as dividing my variable x and taking the power so that's my free definition of my free functions okay with the n defined in this free case so why do i show you this because here so far it's just a fancy way to to define a free mechanism to build functions but i want to consider what happens when i take larger and larger n which is something we started to do there we took f2 f3 so what will happen if i take f4 f5 f6 f7 f10 f100 f1 million what happens to the thing so we see that the terms that we add they become smaller and smaller so if we look at what happens inside for instance I will say that fn i will introduce a new quantity which is a, a number the n to the power of x so that we can separate the variable from what is more important which is um which is the thing that varies in my definition of function so we've got e0 e1 we computed already this thing so e1 e0 is 1 e1 is uh, 1 plus 1 is 2 e3 is 2 plus 1 half 2.5 e4 is the one we calculated there is uh, 2.5 plus 1.16 so that's 2.66 e5 equal 2.66 plus what comes after one uh, one three factorial is one four factorial that's um that's 24 so i would have to compute that the story is that if you do it i'm showing you again the result of the calculation there you got the result this is in your notes you see that i'm letting the result on the screen you see that the corrections of the various uh, increasing term is smaller and smaller in the sense that it is touching the uh, the digit the decimals that are farther and farther so at a point if we are not able to look after let's say 10 or 100 decimals we don't see the change we don't see that something happened so here there is an interesting process which is called a limiting process or to take the limit we are going to write it like this we are going to call not precisely f infinite because it's not needed we just call it f we remove the dependence on n 
because n doesn't do anything, we don't see its effect anymore, we will say that this is the result when we take the limit of n going to infinity of fn of x. And for the case of a sum, we are actually going to get rid of it and write it like this. We write in the uh, numerator the infinite sum. So you might worry about taking an infinite sum, and we will discuss this again next lecture, where we will discuss about infinite, but you understand that it's legitimate in these cases where we've got this phenomenon of convergence, which means that uh, there starts to be a point where the result doesn't change to our perception. I mean, we have to look closer and closer, we have to chase uh, more digits to see a change. And if we don't do that, we don't see a difference. So that's what the limit does. So f of x, by definition, is 1 divided by k factorial, everybody to the power of x. If I do the same for g, I'm taking the limit of gn, I will get, I remind you the definition there, I will get the sum to infinity of my x k over k factorial. And for uh, h, how do we do for h? So h, we are not going to do this because this infinite that I was able to substitute before would enter in two different places. And then it becomes kind of um, ambiguous, at least, uh, which one we apply first. And if we divide the number by infinity is 0, so then we have to take the infinite power of 1. It's messy. So we don't do it like this. What we do instead is that we keep the limit. We keep the limit in front. So we keep the n there. This says, this says that uh, to compute this quantity, we have to compute this, which is well defined for any finite n, just compute it, and we take n larger and larger and larger. And we see if these things become more and more stable. If it stops changing, if it's converging, then that's the result there. So the beautiful thing is that these uh, three functions defined like this, f and j and h, they are equal. They are equal to one functions that we call the natural exponential. Natural because um, it is the one that involves this number here, e uh, infinite, or the limit of e n when n goes to infinity, where e n is defined like this, e n is this partial sum, that's e n. We uh, actually don't put the infinite neither, we call it e, and this is the Euler number. Euler number. So when we look at the exponential of this particular constant, the Euler number, we don't call it, well, we call it the natural exponential, but it's so important that we actually call it exponential. Exponential is taking the x power of any constant, of any given number. 2, 3, 2 to the x is an exponential, 3 to the x is an exponential. But e to the x, we call it the natural exponential. It being so important, we call it the exponential, yeah, instead of natural exponential. So all these things are equal to the exponential function, which we write like this. So that's an example along with, by the way, sine and cos, that's an example of functions that take three letters, yeah? x, sine, cos, the exponential. So we are going to demonstrate this in the time that we have left. The exponential function is defined from r to r plus, is defined by any of these three mechanisms. And I take this case to show you that a function, indeed, it is some object of the platonic ex uh, universe that exists independently of our, uh, of our definition. Yeah, we have different way we can access it or define it or provide different mechanism. Here we've got three of them. There are more that exist, including some geometrical one. We've got a free mechanism to uh, tell you for whatever x you give, you fit with this function, which number it will spit out. Okay, but this exponential it has an existence of its own. It has its property. It has like its little uh, Mandelbrot secret and this uh, fractal structure. Uh, that we could look at. And we are going to use it, for instance, to look at trigonometry. It's a function, the exponential, that we are going to find over and over again in physics. It's a really important function. That's why I chose this one to illustrate this point. So uh, let's demonstrate it, because at university level, everything should be demonstrated or clearly uh, stated as uh, being a postulate. But we can demonstrate this. It's not too difficult, especially if we don't do it very carefully. And we can't do it carefully because we didn't introduce too much uh, formalism regarding the limits. We we'll discussed the limits in the coming lectures. But so far, we can do it actually pretty much like Euler himself did it, which is uh, to uh, have the big idea. We'll take, we'll start with h, which is defined like this. And um, we already demonstrated, I will assume that this is already demonstrated, that this uh, e is the limit of en. So instead of writing en, I will write properly what it is that's a 1 over k factorial, where k goes from 0 to n. That's our definition of e. So how to do this? Uh, here, this binomial uh, expansion that jumps to our i, that seems the obvious thing to do. So binomial expansion, it would be k 
k from 0 to if we take the limit when n goes to infinity we will have to take an infinite sum so I will put it right away there we've got by definition of the binomial expansion this binomial k choose in n then we've got 1 to the power of the uh, whatever it is of k but I will keep the k for the other variable that's simpler so 1 to the power of n minus k a is always finite huh, because I take the limit at the end so I will leave uh, this uh, I will not write it because 1 to the power of whatever it is will always be 1 so it doesn't appear and the other term is x divided by n to the power of k so that's the um, that's the binomial expansion applied to this thing I could keep if you want the limit in front yeah if that, if that helps you to accept the thing you can put the n here okay like this we don't have uh, some uncertainty of what happens with this uh, infinite sum because the sum is always finite it's only at the end that we take larger and larger sum. okay so let's keep playing with this uh, actually I will now expand the, the thing starting from the beginning so we've got 0 n 0 n x over n to the power of 0 plus 1 n x over n to the power of 1 plus 2 n x over n to the power of 2 make some room of course I will stop at some point eh? it's just to so that we get an idea of what's going on x divided by n to the power of 3 okay so 0 n is 1 x divided by n to the power of 0 is 1 then we've got n and here we've got x to the n which is also something simple we can start to simplify it below that's 1 then here we've got n to the 2 so this is n n minus 1 divided by 2 and here I've got x over uh, n x over n why twice because it's a square it's multiplied by himself then here we've got n n minus 1 n minus 2 divided by 6 by 3 factorial so if you ask why it's like this because I remind you that kn is n factorial divided by k factorial n minus k factorial so what I'm doing is that I'm keeping this k factorial there and I'm uh, replacing this I'm simplifying this I'm uh, removing this uh, successive term as you can check if it's not uh, apparent or obvious it's like that take the time to look that it simplifies in this way and then we have it uh, three times because it's a cube so on and so forth okay so let's simplify this n goes away then we've got x squared divided by 2 and we are left with this quantity that I will put here with this color this is n minus 1 n then we come back to where we were at the next order the n cancel one of them cancel and we've got x cube divided by 6 and then what is left is this thing which is a n minus 1 divided by n n minus 2 divided by n and then we'll have to carry on doing this you can do more order if you want let me get rid of this uh, remove it so we've got 1 plus x plus x squared divided by 2 actually uh, I don't have to write it again uh, we can uh, now look at this quantity let's take a still shallower color maybe this one so what happens is this remember that n I will I can take it larger and larger yeah I, eventually we take the limit so which means that whenever I consider this quantity I take a finite n then I look what happens for the bigger n, then for still bigger n, and still for bigger n, so on and so forth. So with this term, nothing happens. They don't depend on n. This one neither, but is multiplied by this quantity. And what happens with this quantity? n minus 1 divided by n, or 1 minus 1 over n, you can see it's something that is closer and closer to 1. So if I take uh, n large enough, I will bring this second term as close as x uh, squared divided by 2, as close to that as I want. So I can remove it and consider that this is 1 because this number is as small as I 1 is as small to 1 as I want to make it. And the same there. This is uh, as close to 1 as I want and this as well. It goes to 1 uh, slower because it's n minus 2 divided by n. And this goes to 1 slower because the, the, the numerator is a bit farther than n. But it still goes uh, to 1. Check it. Take uh, the computer the pocket calculator and fit some number of n and see that the larger is n the closer to 1 is this number so this for n large enough it will go to x cube over 6 yeah that's the process of convergence I have to take n so that I don't see its impact or its effect on this term so for the uh, higher and higher order so x4 I will get 24 which is 4 factorial here I will get n minus 1 over n n minus 2 over n n minus 3 over n the same thing is the product of three things 
Each of them gets as close to 1 as I want. And to any order, if I take x of 7 divided by 7 factorial, I don't know how much is 7 factorial, it's a very big number, will be n minus 1 over n, n minus 2 over n, n minus 3 over n, blah blah blah, n minus uh, 6 over n. So it's a product of, of 6 numbers, each of them becomes as close to 1 as possible. Yeah? But it's always finite. For any order, it's finite. It's a finite product of numbers that each can get as close to 1 as I want. Therefore, it should convince you, at least it convinces you there, it might take time for you to uh, convince yourself fully that this is the case, but in the limit, my, my products of n, of ratios of n that get close to 1, they simplify to this. So that demonstrates this, we started with uh, h, that demonstrates that h, which is this thing, is equal to, uh, which one was it? To this one, to g. h is equal to g. We demonstrated that, yeah, because in g, if you look again, that's this infinite sum, where we got rid of the n. Here we have the n, uh, n minus 1, n minus uh, so on and so forth, that come from the, uh, the n that was there in the binomial expansion. So now that we did h equal uh, g, we are going to show that h equal f. And once we did h equal f, given that uh, h equal g, it will have demonstrated as well that f equal g. So this one we don't have to do, f equal g. So h equal f or f equal h, in which order are we going to do it? We are going to do it with h as well to start from the binomial expansion because the idea is a bit the same. Uh, I will do it like this. I will start with the fact that this is the limit when n goes to infinity. That's my definition for h of 1 plus it was x over n divided by n. So actually this is kind of simple. I'm going to write this as 1 divided by n over x. Yeah, if I multiply numerator and denominator by x, you see that I come back to my initial definition of x. Here we do the same, I divide by x and I multiply by x. So why am I doing this? Well, I think you see it now. Because I feel if I define n divided by x as, let us say, nu, that's the letter nu here, I can substitute orange nu. Okay. And what happens uh, when n goes to infinity? So n is equal to nu x. x is uh, always uh, a finite value, it's a finite number. And actually, I could take it as a finite rational, something of the form p over q. Because for any different x, I take, uh, I take the, the p and q that corresponds to the rational I choose. We could do it for with the real number as well, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter much, actually, because we are not after rigorous proof. I just want to convince you, at least to make you feel that there is a reason why these things are equal. So, um, given that these are integers, uh, new p is also an integer, and I can, I can take new when I take these limiting values, I can take news that is always a multiple of q. I can restrict my choice of, of news to be multiple of q. So that this will simplify there, and I will get something which is an integer. So big integer, I will call mu, for instance. Yeah? I could call it mu, is defined in such a way that these things there, that becomes mu, these things is always an integer. So when my... Um, when my n goes to infinity, what happens to my mu, which is a multiple of q, q being the denominator of the rational approximation of x, what happens to mu? Of course, mu also goes to infinity. Yeah? So I can put the mu there. It's the same. When n goes to infinity, mu, which is defined after it, goes to infinity actually even faster, yeah? because it makes bigger jump. You could go to infinity by counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This one would be doing 10, 20, 30. Yeah? And this, we know what this is already, these things. Yeah, this is E by definition. It was in my box, my Euler box. That's E, that's the definition. Um, that's not this definition. This is the definition of E after the inverse term. This is, um, yeah, we would have to demonstrate it from the previous one, from the previous one, from the one that we just established, which is H equal G. Because if we look now at the particular case where uh, H of one, h of 1 is, is this limit of 1 plus 1 over n to the power of n, and this is, uh, this is defined like this. So that's u, but it's not so straightforward. Yeah? We have to use, again, the result that we just demonstrated. So this is a conclusion of what I just said. If we apply our previous result to this, we've got the limit when mu goes to infinity of this is equal to e or e being defined as the sum of 1 over k factorial, infinite sum. 
So here, the last, uh, the last statement before we conclude this lecture, we just have to see that if we've got, if we've got uh, something which is, uh, let's say, a sequence a n that tends toward a, this, by the way, is a notation that we are going to use over and over again. This is a notation for the limit of a n equal a, when n goes to infinity. Instead of writing all this limit and specifying the thing, we just write an arrow, because it looks like what it is. It tends toward, a n tends toward. So I was saying if a n tends to a, then a n x tends to a x. So this, uh, I don't know if we need to prove it now. I'll just take it as obvious for now. If, we ne if needed, we'll uh, come back to it when we look at our uh, limiting lectures, because we are going to come back to this uh, process of taking limits. So far, this is just a tool for us to define functions that achieves our proof. Yeah, that achieves our proof because we've got the x, and therefore we've got this to the x, and when we've got the x, this was our expression, which was h, with the n here, with the x in its place here. So we've got this, the x is equal to is equal to uh, x. I have to put the x everywhere, okay? I have to put the x. And then this is the uh, xk here. That comes from before, so actually I shouldn't put it there. What we demonstrated properly is this part. So that achieves to prove that we've got g, sorry, it's h equal f before we demonstrated h equal g. So that demonstrates that these three things are equal. We we'll come back to these three things that are defined in this box. So I will remove the thing that we don't need. And I will put a color, a nice red color around this because it's very important that this free definition, taking the limits, there was one with the limits maybe below. I'm not looking at the good box. That's the one I wanted. Yeah. So this one, they are all equal. There are three important, all useful, important in their respective way, definition of one and the same object, the exponential. This is interesting because this is a so-called non-closed form way to provide an algebraic formula to define a function. The over one, they were closed form. Closed form, it means that it's there just to compute maybe, but uh, you just uh, you just look at it. You have the result on the table. It's well defined by direct calculation. Well, yeah, it's non-closed form because there is something to compute, but in a way that is not straightforward. Yeah? You have to figure out what is this infinite sum. So you have a, non a tricky operation to do. Maybe even it's just a formal definition and you can't actually compute. Uh, you can only make approximation or finite uh, estimation of the results. So now we have defined these functions. We already started to delve into this very important aspect of mathematics, which is the infinity. We took the limit, yeah, and we took the limit by making uh, things, the number n larger and larger, looking at more and more uh, additions, uh, to smaller additions to the thing. It can go in both sides, infinity. It can go the infinitely big and it can go the infinitely small. We have seen already in our first lecture that we could dive into the infinitely small or we could um, go into the infinitely large. Remember this, uh, this scale, uh, 10 minus 45 on the Planck's length and the on the other side, uh, 10 something else. Yeah? So, uh, infinity is really important. That will be the topic of our uh, next lecture where we'll start to look actually at both, at both aspects, both the infinitely small, starting with very famous paradox that also comes from uh, our uh, platonic school, the Zeno paradox. And we also look at what I believe is possibly for everybody. I don't know if you have all seen this before, at least at some level or the other, but I expect most of this is familiar. It's just a new way to look at it. But next lecture, we will start to put a foot, maybe for the first time, at least for all of you, to put a foot in something which is really new, something that you've never seen before. This will be a very beautiful counterintuitive uh, concept, which is connected to this notion of counting infinities, that you're able to count infinity and to see that things, some things are more infinite than others.